All right, welcome everyone to Mountain West ATC Echo. Happy to see you all. Um, I'm going to be talking about the latest ARV drug approval called Bictarvi, uh, which, as I'm sure you know, is Bictegravir combined with Tenofovir alafenamide or TAF and M. tricytabine. Approved on the 7th of February. Interestingly, the approval was met by both a lawsuit from Vive and an announcement by Vive about a new study looking at switching from TAF to Dolutegravir 3TC dual therapy. And we'll come back to dual therapy a bit next week. And I'm not going to go into more detail about that, let you read about it, but I think the whole milieu with these new ARVs and approvals is pretty interesting right now. What I will do today is just look a little bit at the clinical trial data. Some of it we've reviewed in the past. Um, I'll just give you a review of what we know and some things we don't know about BICTARV. Uh, talk about the uh, indications uh, per the package insert and then what we know about drug interactions and drug resistance thus far. A note to please see more detail at the National HIV Curriculum site. There is more up there than I'll be able to go through today. But let's start with some of the clinical trials. First, two trials that looked at BIC-TAR-V, which I will abbreviate as BIC-TAF-FTC. You will also see it abbreviated some places as BF-TAF. This trial, 1489, looked at BIC-TAGAVIR, TAF-FTC versus Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Lamivudine, or 3TC, which is Triomec in treatment-naive individuals. So this was a randomized control trial that enrolled treatment-naive adults with detectable viral loads, estimated GFRs above 50, who were negative for HLA B5701 because they could be randomized to Abacavir, and who did not have chronic hepatitis B because, of course, as we've talked about before, Triomec would not be sufficient treatment for HIV hep B co-infection. But there were just over 300 individuals randomized to either arm, either Bictegravir, TAF-FTC, or Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Lamivudine. I'll let you look at this, the baseline characteristics, um, much of which is not surprising and pretty standard for what we see in most treatment-naive trials these days. And here is the punchline. Uh, in the intention to treat FDA snapshot analysis, uh, initial therapy with Bictegravir, TAF-FTC was non-inferior to initial therapy with Dolutegravir, Abacavir, 3TC. The remainder here of the individuals who are not suppressed at 48 weeks, you can look and see what happened with them in the publication, but most were not virologic failures. Most of it was lack of data and other factors. Importantly, no treatment emergent resistance to any study drug occurred in either arm of the study. So no integrase resistance and no NRTI resistance. Looking at side effects and tolerability. So here is the breakdown per the Lancet publication of the Bictegravir arm compared to the Dolutegravir arm. I've bolded here the significant difference, which was more frequent nausea in the Dolutegravir, Abacavir, Lamivudine arm, which I largely, if not completely, attribute to the Abacavir component. We know some percentage of people just don't tolerate Abacavir very well because of nonspecific side effects like nausea. I think the thing many people, myself included, were interested in was the rates of headache and insomnia, which were not largely different between Bictegravir and Dolutegravir in this trial. So I don't think we can say much about the likelihood of those side effects with Bictegravir compared to Dolutegravir, and I suspect we will learn more about that in the post-marketing, post-approval sort of surveillance and analyses. In this trial, the estimated effect on GFR was very similar between Bictegravir and Dolutegravir. It was slightly different in the next trial I'll show you. There was no significant difference in markers of proximal tubulopathy at 48 weeks here in this trial comparing the TAF-based regimen to the Abacavir-based regimen. There also was no significant difference between the two arms in change in bone mineral density. As with the majority of ART, bone mineral density did decrease somewhere between, this is percent change, half a percent and a full percent change over the year of initial ART. Pretty consistent with most data for initial ART, and we would expect TDF to be worse than that. But no real difference here with big TAF, FTC, and dog paper back of your 3TC. Also, the change in lipids, and this is not percent, this is median absolute number change, so these numbers, as you can see, are pretty darn small. We're not dramatically different. Maybe a little bit of difference here in triglycerides, but again, small numbers, and I don't make a lot of that. So I would say overall, no profound difference in effect on lipids between these two initial therapy options. But let's then look at BIC TAF FTC compared to Dolutegravir plus TAF FTC. So here, really, the only difference is Bictegravir versus 
dolutegravir. Again, this is a treatment-naive trial, phase three randomized study that enrolled treatment-naive adults allowed to have in this study GFR of 30 or greater with a detectable viral load and here allowed to have chronic hepatitis B because both of these would be adequate regimens for hep B. But like with most trials, I think we've talked about this before, even though those are the inclusion criteria, there were very small numbers with chronic hep B or chronic hep C. And even though participants were allowed to have lower GFRs or lower creatinine clearance, the median entry creatinine clearance was quite high. Here again is the punchline, a non-inferior rate of virologic suppression at 48 weeks comparing big TAF FTC to dolutegravir plus TAF FTC. No participant discontinued due to lack of efficacy in either arm, and again, no treatment emergent resistance to any study drug occurred. When we look at the tolerability and adverse events comparing the two arms, largely similar here, again, rates of headache and insomnia not significantly different. That's my main interest looking at these because I think those are the main reasons people don't tolerate dolutegravir. In this study, rates of nausea were very similar. Interestingly, in this study, the effect on GFR was less in the bictegravir arm, so some suggestion that perhaps the effect on GFR with bictegravir is less than with dolutegravir. But again, that was a little different between these two treatment-naive trials. We'll look at one switch study, and then I'll come back to some other sort of questions of interest about BICTARV and talk about the indications. So this was a switch trial we saw presented at ID week. So this is a switch from a boosted PI plus two NRTIs to BICTAF FTC in adults with viral suppression. So the inclusion criteria here were adults who were suppressed for at least six months on a stable regimen with no history of treatment failure, no prior treatment with an integrase inhibitor, GFR above 50, and at baseline taking either boosted atazanavir or boosted darunavir along with TDF-FTC or abacavir 3-TC. So that was the enrollment criteria. It was an open label switch study. I think there's always some caveats to open label switch studies. I think we have to remember that a lot of people enter these studies because they want to switch. And so there's always sort of a, an asterisk or a caveat to the results. However, we can learn interesting things. So in this study, individuals taking the boosted PI plus two NRTIs were randomized to either BICTAF FTC or to stay on their current regimen. These are the entry criteria, which I'll let you look at, but I'll just highlight that at baseline, the majority were taking TDF FTC, 85% or so in each arm. So the baseline NRTIs were primarily TDF based and the baseline PIs were pretty well split between darunavir and atazanavir. Here is the efficacy again, bictegravir meeting criteria for non-inferiority for virologic suppression at 48 weeks as compared to continuing a boosted PI. This again is in individuals who are already suppressed for at least six months. Some important notes here at the bottom. So no treatment emergent resistance occurred in the BICTAF FTC arm. One individual receiving darunavir boosted by ritonavir plus abacavir lamivudine in the maintained current regimen arm developed an L74V, which is a signature abacavir mutation, which is interesting to me. It makes me think maybe they weren't taking their boosted darunavir. That was the only resistance mutation that was detected. Looking at side effects, again, these are individuals who had been in the big TAF FTC arm. These are individuals who had been stable on a boosted PI to NRTIs and then switched. So with the switch, we do expect report of some new side effects. So you can see here about 12% reported headache. Um, and so I think that's not surprising. Again, it looks like bictegravir can cause headache, at least per these initial trials, at a somewhat similar rate to dolutegravir. So I'm not surprised that those switching to bictegravir did report headache more often than those who stayed on the regimen they'd been stable on. But so it does seem bictegravir has some potential to cause headache. You can see here that a, a lot of what was in this table presented at ID week was things we may not attribute to the study drugs, but this is what was reported. And again, it looks like when people switch to bictegravir, we do expect GFR to change somewhat in a manner similar to dolutegravir, though maybe that's less than dolutegravir. I don't think 
we fully know the impact uh, there yet, but certainly can change. So in terms of change in lipids, so in these individuals who switched from boosted PI to BIC, TAF, FTC, or BIC, TARV, lipids really remained pretty flat. And so I, I think this is a bit hard to interpret because the switch from the boosted PI to Bictegravir, we'd posit maybe would have a benefit to lipids. But again, majority of these people were switching from TDF to TAF, uh, which we know can have a mildly detrimental effect on lipids. So I think those maybe cancel each other out. So switching from a boosted PI plus most people in this trial getting TDF to BIC, TAF, FTC did not have a large impact on lipids. That's the clinical trial data I was going to review for you. There is, again, more data on the curriculum site. One thing I wanted to highlight is what's in the package insert and the FDA approval for BICTARV is really only two indications. I was a bit surprised by this, and I think it's a bit conservative, but we can talk about that. So the two indications listed are, one, adults who have no ARB treatment history. So certainly a very reasonable regimen for the person who's treatment naive and never been treated before. The other indication is to replace the current ARV regimen if virologically suppressed on a stable regimen for at least three months with no history of treatment failure and no known resistance to the individual components. So really as a maintenance switch option for people who are suppressed and well controlled without a history of failure or resistance, sort of similar to the dolutegravirapivirine or Jaluca kind of maintenance strategy. It does say pretty clearly in the package insert that Bictarvi should not be combined with other ARVs. And I was a little surprised by that. Um, we have no reason to think that the drug interactions would be significantly different than dolutegravir, but Bictegravir just hasn't really been studied, and there's no data in the package insert about interactions with darunavir or etravirine or anything like that. So I think a conservative approach is really just to stick with these two indications until we know more. But again, we don't have any reason to think that interactions with other ARVs would be dramatically different than with dolutegravir. So I think an outstanding question is how to incorporate BIC, TAF, FTC in those salvage patients who maybe currently are getting dolutegravir plus TAF, FTC, and whether we can change. The package insert would suggest we should wait on that. I guess my, my impression is maybe that's a bit conservative, but until we have more data, that would be the recommended approach. Some questions that I was wondering, and we've talked a little bit about this before, it does seem that Bictegravir has an interaction with cations similar to dolutegravir, and this is what's in the package insert. It does seem that it raises metformin levels. However, there is a suggestion that the impact on metformin is less than with dolutegravir, and it is quite clear that there's an interaction with rifampin, and rifampin should be avoided. It, rifampin lowers both TAF levels, so rifampin and TAF should not be combined, and rifampin also lowers bictegravir levels. In the package insert, there is mention uh, that some hep C drugs like ladipasvir, sofosbuvir, sofosbuvir in general, sofosbuvir velpatasvir are okay with Bictarvi, so that is in the package insert. And there are some other interactions with specific antiarrhythmics, anticonvulsants, and other things that are worth reviewing if you have a patient taking those. But those are the main interactions I wanted to highlight. A quick note about drug resistance with Bictegravir, and this again is from the package insert. So like with dolutegravir in the clinical trials, development of resistance really did not happen with Big taf ftc integrase resistance or NRTI resistance. And we know with people starting dolutegravir-based therapy as their initial regimen, resistance is incredibly rare, both integrase resistance or, and NRTI resistance. And as far as we know to date with Bictegravir, it seems to be similar. Now the numbers were pretty small. The numbers of individuals who had detectable viral loads and were assessed for resistance was eight in the treatment naive trials and three in the switch trials. So I think we'll need ongoing data on this, but as far as we can tell from the trials, uh, Bictegravir seems to have a high barrier resistance similar to dolutegravir, and resistance seems to be rare. One note that I think is important is like with dolutegravir, if someone has failed raltegravir or elvitegravir, with integrase mutations, those mutations can impact Bictegravir. So also from the package insert, in isolates with known integrase mutations that were tested with Bictegravir, those that had these common raltegravir or elvitegravir pathway mutations 
alone really did not impact bictegravir at all. However, as we've talked about with dolutegravir, those that had a Q148 plus secondary mutations did have significantly reduced activity of bictegravir. So the overall resistance pattern is that it's very similar to dolutegravir. Somebody starting it as their first regimen or as a maintenance strategy is unlikely to develop resistance, but those people who failed elvitegravir or raltegravir, especially those with a Q148 pathway with secondary mutations, can have reduced bictegravir activity. In conclusion, BICTARV or BICTAF FTC does appear to be effective for initial ART or as a maintenance strategy. It does appear to have possibly some small advantages over dolutegravir, maybe less effect on metformin, maybe less effect on GFR, but I think we need more data. I'd really like to know if rates of neuropsychiatric symptoms like headache and insomnia are less, but I think it's going to take time to see how that bears out in clinical trials. And uh, I think we need more guidance on how to use this in salvage therapy and combined with other ARVs, and hopefully that is all coming. There are some switch trials that I think we'll see data from in the relatively near future. I didn't show you this, but the switch trial from dolutegravir, Bacavir 3TC, or dolutegravir plus a Bacavir 3TC is mentioned in the package insert, but not in a lot of detail, and we suspect that will be presented at an upcoming conference, and we'll know more. There are also ongoing trials of switching from, this is elvitegravir, cobacistat, emtricitabine, TAF, which is Genvoya, or TDF-containing ART in individuals over 65 years old. And there is this other switch trial from these baseline regimens in women that are ongoing. And I suspect we'll see that data in the near future. That is my summary of what we know about Bictarvi. Happy to have a discussion, happy to hear thoughts and questions.